As you guys know, I've been laid up with COVID for a while. This is, uh, I'm out of quarantine. I don't have leprosy. You can talk to me, hug me. We're all good. I guess the Lord didn't want to take me home just yet. It was like a loaf of bread, not quite baked. Back in the oven. So that's okay. You guys enjoyed David Brewer while he was here? He was a good teacher, right? He's got all kinds of letters after his name, so I figured he'd be okay. I was just worried he might spoil you. Anyway, we are back into the book of Romans. Uh, one of the best books you'll ever be able to find in the Bible as far as teaching's concerned. And we're looking at Israel. If you remember the, the format, these last three chapters have been about Israel. Uh, so 9, 10, and 11 is about, well, if chapter 8 is true and there, you know, we're not, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God, well, then what do you do with Israel? Because Israel is no longer God's favorite child in a matter of speaking. And so what do you do about that? Because they have the covenants, the word of God, they have the prophets, they have the history. Do you know it's the only civilization on the planet that has 4,000 years of recorded history? And Jerusalem is still in Jerusalem. It's a remarkable thing. The Jewish people themselves are a, a, a commentary on God's faithfulness because you see all these other nations come and go, but the Jewish people are still here today because of God's promises. And we can bet on the same God that made the promises to us through Jesus Christ. Well, let's pray before we get started. Father, as we get into this very doctrinal book, I pray that you might help us to apply it to our lives, that we would be more like you in whatever way it is you see inside of us that needs to be that way. And help us to learn and to understand more of how you are with the Jews so we might understand how you are with us. So, Lord, speak to our hearts by your Holy Spirit. I pray that you might help all those who are watching online who aren't well, that you would raise them up. I thank you, Karen Foley and, and others. Lord, strengthen them and help them. And help us here today, Lord, as we dive into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay. I'm getting ahead of myself. In verse 15, chapter 11, it says, For in their being cast away is the reconciliation of the world. What will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the Jews have been kind of put aside so that the Gentiles might come to know the Jewish Savior, wow, isn't it going to be cool when the Jews come back? And they are going to come back. There are places that teach and Christian churches that teach that God is done with the Jews. He's done. He divorced them because they committed adultery. And yet, he's made promises, and he's going to continue to bless Israel. So we're going to take a look at that and understand what the Scripture teaches us about it. So... Going over our outline, we're in chapter 11, which speaks of Israel in their future. And so we're going to be talking about how God is going to use you people, you, yes, you people, to attract the Jewish people to their own Messiah. And that is God's plan, by the way. So I wonder how many people you're making jealous. So chapters 9 to 11 is going to be about Israel. Last time... As Paul was speaking about the Jewish people, he says this, but I say, have they not heard, speaking of the Jewish people with the word and the prophets and Moses and everything they had? And he said, yes, indeed. And then he quotes a passage, their sound has gone out into all the earth and their words to the end of the world. But I say, did Israel not know about Jesus and about him being the Messiah that he would come? He said, for Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation, and I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. By the way, it's you and me. But Isaiah is very bold, and he says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, 
All day long I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. So he's trying to show from the scriptures that God's chosen people, the Jews, as you may know them, God selected, but the question is, what did he select them for? And we as the Gentiles come to understand who God is by not having the law of Moses, by not having all of the Old Testament, understanding the prophets, having memorized Deuteronomy, you know, all of these kind of things that would be part of a very uh, good Jewish boy's upbringing. Uh, they, would, they would have the, the, the Torah down. They would have the first five books down. I don't know about you, but I didn't grow up with any religious training whatsoever except if it feels good, do it, which didn't work out well for me. And he says, I've long stretched out my hands to these people and they're rebellious and contrary and they don't, they just don't listen. Because the tendency of all people, not just the Jews, is to take pride in some thing instead of someone. Some thing that I do that makes me good enough and acceptable before God. And certainly in the Old Testament, you know, there's, there's 300 plus things that you can do to please God. And uh, much like a chain, if you have a weak link in there, then you've just, your lifeline is broken because you've broken the law. The law was never destined to make us right with God. It was destined to show us that we need a savior. Amen? Amen. So, moving on, beginning in verse one. I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. For God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew, or do you not know that the scripture says of Elijah how he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so, then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer by works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. I think he was being funny there. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their back always. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provide to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, then so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them become a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Do not boast against the branches, but if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand by faith, do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, 
consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell, severity, but toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you will also be cut off. That's when the whole congregation goes, I'm, not, I'm surprised I didn't hear it. So, big lengthy piece of scripture. Aren't you so glad that you came today? I'm going, I'm going to go through it efficiently, but quickly. Verse 1. The question is, has God left his people? Did God abandon Israel? Is Israel no more? Has the church taken their place as those who are receiving all the benefits and the covenant um, relationship that God had with his people? No. Although there are some people who would like to say so. So, has God finished with his people? Has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. You remember Paul, whose name was Saul, who came from Tarsus, who was a very well-educated Pharisee when God found him. Kind of scared him as he was walking to go have some other Christians killed. I, I picture God going, boo, you know, and he just fell off his mount and... That's pretty much what God did. He played a joke on him and knocked him off his horse and there was a light so bright he couldn't see. And he says, who are you, Lord? He says, I am the Lord Jesus Christ whom you persecute. He recognized it was God that was speaking to him and he said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus Christ whom you persecute. That is one heck of a testimony right there. Mind pales in comparison. And yet the Lord saves him in this state. And so he says, listen, if you think God forget his, forgot his people, what about me? I'm one of his people. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Jew. God saved me. So you can't say God did away with all of the Jewish people because, oh, my goodness, the whole church was Jewish, right? Peter, James, John, you remember all those guys? They're all Jewish, all of them, including Jesus. So... Has God cast away his people? Of course not. And he says, listen, I'm evidence. Paul uses himself as exhibit A. And he says, I'm evidence that God has not. He hasn't forgotten about his people. So what is God doing? It says here in Philippians 3, verses 4 to 9, this is Paul's resume, if you will. He says, though I might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, in other words, what you can do, produce, or your lineage, then I more so. Circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, the strictest sect, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Now there's some zeal. Concerning the righteousness which is of the law, blameless. Nobody can point a finger at me and say I did anything wrong. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted for loss for Christ. In other words, it was an exchange. I give God all those things that I'm so proud of and I think are so important, and what I get is Christ. And what I give up is a bunch of stuff that really didn't mean anything. Yet, indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish. You guys know what rubbish is, right? That the actual original word is dung. It's a pile that your neighbor's dog left on the lawn. It's the G version. I count them as a big pile of something that the great Dane left on my front lawn. That I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. There's only two religions. One is... I'm going to do my best to make myself acceptable to God in which everyone is a dismal failure. Or you accept the free gift of Jesus' life given for you in your place and you accept his righteousness. And when that happens, it changes everything. So it's either you're going to be good enough and try to live up to everything God said and we all fail and we're going to have to stand in judgment for that. Or... You can receive a free gift. It's, it's the best deal you ever get. You know that, right? 
So why doesn't the world know? God has not cast away his people. God does not unchoose one whom he has selected. That's essentially what he's trying to say. He uses the individual thing. Has God forgotten Israel as a nation? He says, no. He says, look at me. I'm, I'm a Jew. God does not unchoose somebody. In Romans 8, verses 29 to 31, it says this, for whom he foreknew, because his choosing is always in collaboration with his foreknowledge. How many, is that over your head? How many people is that over your head? You, you know foreknowledge? Okay, you don't know foreknowledge. Well, neither do I. I just know I'm going to have I'm going to have lunch later. <laughs> For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That Jesus was the firstborn among. In other words, he's the head of us, if you will. It's a position, not necessarily that he was born, but it's a position of authority. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these also he justified. And whom he justified, these also he glorified. Which is spoken of in the past tense, like it's already done. What then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did, he who did not withhold his own son, but gave him for us all, how will he also not with him give us all other things freely? The scripture says. So, God doesn't choose and unchoose people. So if anybody told you that, you can tell them to check the scriptures. The chosen. Isn't it odd for God to choose the Jews? Isn't it odd for God to choose the Jews? It's a rhyme. Did you see the rhyme? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really working hard up here. He chose Abraham. He was a idol worshiper, chose him out of an idol worshiping family and said, yeah, I choose you. And he, he told him something and he believed it. And he says, no problem. I'm going to bless your whole family because you believed it. That seems awfully simple. You mean just by having faith in what God said and believing it, that all of the nations will be blessed by his family and through his seed, who is Jesus Christ? Yeah. It's amazing. Well, you, you look at Look at Jacob and Isaac, and you look at some of the people that get produced from Abraham, and you go, not really the pinnacles of perfection. You, you look at, uh, you get 12 brothers, and they, they go to kill the one brother because he's favored, and he's got a nice coat, and dad likes him better, and, you know, everybody's arguing about who's sleeping with who, and paying people off in pomegranates, and, like... It's very bizarre that God would choose, and yet he did. And he stuck with him through all the things that happened. So, isn't it odd that God would choose any of you? I, I, I don't know why God chose me. I don't have a vocabulary. I don't have, um, I don't have a million letters after my name. I don't, I don't, but you know what? I got COVID twice and lived, so <laughs> that's something. Isn't it odd that God would choose any of us? Why not just erase us like so many bad chalk marks on a board and start over? But he didn't. So why did God choose the Jewish people? When you think about the chosen, God's chosen people, and you think about the Jews, I think there's some confusion, and especially as you go through this passage. It, there seems to be some kind of a discounting where they're no longer on the front burner of God's favor. And yet... God is still working in the Jewish nation to save them. Right now, we're in a time where we as Gentiles, the majority of us are here Gentiles, we are here to make Israel jealous. Because Israel was selected by God to reveal him to the world. That's what they were chose for. They weren't chosen because they were ideal, you know, law keepers. They weren't chosen because they had some kind of a stellar background. They weren't chosen for any other reason other than God said, I got to show myself through somebody. I'm going to pick you. And you said yes. So, ta-da, you're there. It's the same thing with you, isn't it? Because you said yes. So, what did God choose the Jewish people for? The mistaken identity is that they're all saved because they're related to Abraham. Well, that's funny because that's what they thought. 
They thought, because I'm related to Abraham, I got a golden ticket, man. I'm going in. You Gentiles, you sick, twisted people, you're done. God's going to burn you all. But we're good because we know Abraham. That was the mentality. And yet, we can get that mentality in the church, right? Well, I got a Grace Bible Fellowship. I'm going to heaven. I know that. I don't know about you. We can gain this sort of a pride thing, which is not based on grace, but it's based on some kind of work that we bring. So, why did God choose the, peop the Jewish people? I have four things that I could think of off the top of my head as I was typing. To reveal himself to the world. God reveals himself to the world. Here's a culture that's been around for 4,000 years and is still there. And Jerusalem is still there. It's an amazing thing that the Jewish people came back and reclaimed that. You don't, you don't know of anybody else who does that. There's nobody else in the face of the earth that has a 4,000 years worth of history to write down and they still occupy that land. Surprise. To bring his only son into the world. For God to become like us, he needed a human host who we know as Mary. And God worked all of it down all the way to the tribe of Judah, to, to Jesse, to David, to Jesus to reveal himself to the world. He chose the Jewish people. And it was said long, long time ago that he would. To be an example of righteousness. That's why they went to Mount Sinai and they got the law and God delivered Moses and then he delivered the people from Egypt so that he might have fellowship with them. And then he said, hey, this is how you guys are gonna set yourself up as a nation. These are the laws that you're gonna follow and this is how you're gonna run things, not the way it was in Egypt, not the way it was in Canaan. This is how I want you guys to run things. And they said, okay. They were to be an example of righteousness to the world. God's revealed will was shown to the Jewish people. And number four, to be the bride to him. He has created people and chosen them to be in an intimate relationship with him, which is an amazing thing that God would stoop so low to have a relationship with us. I mean... I think I'm doing a dog a favor when I take him out of the pound and preserve him from being euthanized. I feel like I've done a really good thing. But you know what? God, who is perfect, adopts us individually. And he takes all of our mess and he loves us anyway. That's an amazing thing. So, God's chosen people were chosen for a certain thing, not necessarily that every single one of them you're going you're to see in heaven and every Gentile is going to burn. That's the mentality of some, and he's trying to undo that here. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? You remember the prophet Elijah and how he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. In other words, they want to kill me. But what does the divine response say to him? What did God say in response to what he said? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed their knee to Baal. And I have the reference there in 1 Kings. You remember Elijah, God's prophet, spoke to the, the rotten kings and queens, and especially Jezebel, and she had a whole bunch of prophets of Baal. And she was worshiping the way she wanted to worship. And so he challenged them to a duel. It was like, you know, high noon at the OK Corral. And then they were, you know, if your God is God, we're going to set up a, an altar here, and I want you to cry out to Baal, and we're going to set this, this animal up. And uh, if, God, if Baal is God, then have him come down and consume this sacrifice, because that's what you do when you come before God. There has to be a blood sacrifice. And so they said, you got it. So they're all dancing around, cutting themselves, and screaming and yelling, and nothing's going on. And Elijah starts poking fun at him. He goes, eh. Yell, yell louder. Maybe he's hard of hearing. And then he says, maybe he's in the bathroom. You got to read it for yourself. I know you're not going to believe me. Maybe he's relieving himself. Maybe he's tied up. Maybe he's on his phone. Maybe he's... He taunts them, and he goes, okay, now what I want you to do is get a whole bunch of water in the middle of the desert, and I want you to pour it all over this sacrifice. Do it again. No, 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 do it again. Nah, not enough. Do it again. They dig a trench around this sacrifice and they basically made a little waiting pool. He, he has a simple prayer. God comes in a bolt of lightning and <laughs> consumes the sacrifice and all the water. And he goes, you're done, boys. 
and he assassinates them all because it was a fight to the death. You didn't read the fine print, did you? And so he kills all the prophets of Baal, and Jezebel is livid. And she goes, you tell that guy that he's going to be like one of my prophets this time tomorrow. He, you know? And now he runs. He runs. Not the first guy to run from a woman who's angry. So he runs, and he goes out into the desert. He crawls under a bush. He prays that God would kill him. The angels have to give him some food. He goes into a cave. And he stays there. He's been, he's been gone for a while. He's out of circulation. They can't find him. You know, he's thinking about getting a new name and all that. But God calls him out of this cave. And he shows him a storm. And he shows him an earthquake. And there's a giant wind. And there's all this stuff going on. And God wasn't in any of it. And then after all of that, there was a still, small voice. That was God. And he basically, in the Jersey vernacular, said, what are you doing here? And this is what he said. All your people stink. They all, none of them serve you. They've broken laws. They've killed your prophets. And they're after me. And I'm the only one left. That's hilarious. <laughs> you ever feel that way? There's nobody that works so hard in this church as me. There's nobody who does more in this house than me. There's nobody who works harder at this company than me. Well, maybe not you good people, but do you see? It was all about him, and he thought he was the only one left on the face of the planet because all of Israel, as far as he was concerned, you have, a, you have Jezebel, who's a queen, to a king of Israel, and they're worshiping idols. The whole nation is gone topsy-turvy. And he goes, I'm the only one left, and they're going to try to kill me. Jezebel has got a head of steam, and she's looking for me. She's got my name, you know, pasted up on all the telephone poles. It's over. So... God has a plan and a set number of people that are his, and you don't know who they are. Do you know I was probably the worst candidate for somebody to share the gospel with, and somebody did? I was a drug addict doing terrible things, and this dude, Brian, spoke the word of God to me and prayed for me faithfully, and the Lord saved me. I imagine somebody told you about the gospel, too. You probably weren't a great candidate either. <laughs> but God has a select amount of people that he's ready to work in. The question is, like Jesus said, he says, pray that the Lord of the harvest would send out laborers into his field. That was Jesus' biggest concern at the Samaritan at the well. Pray that the Lord of the harvest would send laborers out into his field. Because God's people are out there. It's like fishing. If you go to a lake where there's no fish, you're in deep trouble. You're just going to waste a lot of time. But if you go to a lake that's full of fish, I, I'd go. This world is full of people that want to come to Jesus Christ, and the Lord has primed them, and he's ready. And it might be you that he uses. So, He's got a set number of people. Romans 15, 4 says, For whatever things are written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. You believe that? I imagine that's why you're here today. Because you believe that the scripture actually has the keys to life. God has revealed himself in the scriptures. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, so that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. You know, it takes patience to go through line by line and teach everything little by little because it's just deep and rich and it's, it's like fudge, you know. You don't, you don't want to like take a whole baseball-sized bunch and just jam your face. It's just, it won't go well for you. Whatever things were written were written for our learning. So that's everything in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. It just goes to show you, Elijah does, that... You are not the first over-exaggerating drama queen in history. <laughs> you are not the first person to think you're the only one left. You're the one who, oh, it's about you, isn't it? When I look at Elijah, I go, 
yeah, I, I guess I've been that way. I, I don't know. I've been sick for a couple of weeks. I, you know, you see things differently. But I think of Elijah and what a drama queen he was and how patient God was with him. When he was hungry under a bush, he wanted to die, just let me die. He gave him food. Then he was in a cave all alone. He waited for the right moment until he was listening. And then he said, yeah, I want to show you something. Come on out. <laughs> he had COVID depression, I'm sure, being in that cave. And the Lord showed him all these tremendous and awesome things, and the Lord wasn't in it, but he was in this little still small voice. And he finally heard from God. You know, it was a long time before that ever happened. And you know, that was the end of his ministry. He said, I'm going to take you to, to see a guy whose name is very much like yours, Elisha. And I want you to hand off to him, and he's the next guy. And that was it. He was put out to pasture. This was the end of the line for Elijah. We have to be careful of what we allow into our brains. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. Easy for you to say. <laughs> there is a remnant. That means a, a leftover, a remnant at Home Depot anyway, is a piece of rug that's left after they, they give people all their desired pieces and they have a piece that doesn't quite fit a standard 12 by 12 room, that's a remnant. Or if you're, you're, you're a dressmaker, it's, it's the leftover cloth that you have when you've, you've made the dress and you have some leftover, not enough to make another dress, but you might be able to make something out of it. That's a remnant, it's a leftover. So he says there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And by the way, the remnant is by God's selection as well. And he says there is a leftover. It's not the whole nation of Israel. So we have to be careful that you don't look at what the scripture says when it talks about Israel and think it means every single individual person. So <clears throat> Isaiah 10, to 23 says, for though your people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, a remnant of them will return. The destruction decreed shall overflow with righteousness for the Lord God of hosts will make determined end in the midst of the land. There is a remnant of those. If you remember, Israel eventually split into two parts, the northern area and the southern area. There were 10 tribes and two tribes, essentially. The two tribes they called Judah, even though it was two tribes. And the Assyrians came in and took northern Israel and the Babylonians came in later on and took Jerusalem. And then the Romans came in and took, I, before that you had the Greeks. So like there were always a people that were being subjugated and those who were taken out of Israel, most of them never returned on, on both the Babylonian end and also on the Assyrian end. They just disappeared from the face of the earth, but some came back and God kind of rekindled it like a fire and brought them back. But there's 4,000 years of this, which is an amazing bit of grace on God's behalf. <clears throat> but it says here that only a remnant will return. So this isn't the first time we've heard it in the scriptures. Jesus says it in the New Testament in chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. He admonishes his disciples, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. You know, we live in a world, <clears throat> excuse me, that says, you know, we're all equal, we're all the same, you know, there's nobody that's greater than anybody else. In fact, I can't call you a woman or a man anymore. Apparently, it's illegal. Although during the election, they said, we're going to have a woman of color in the, yeah. I, you know, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, in, in the White House, uh, forgive me. Um, I see hypocrisy and it bothers me. Anyway, so, I, so you want me to treat you, you like a guy if you're a girl? I'm not going to do that. You, you want me to treat you like a girl if you're a guy? I'm not going to do that. Either. So uh, sorry. Anyway. <laughs> It's a narrow gate. You know, not everybody's going to make it to heaven. And there are people that say, well, we're all children of God after all. <laughs> no, we're not. 
because you have to get adopted to be his kid. We're all his creation. He's created all of us and allowed us to live here, absolutely. But not everybody is adopted into the family of God. So if they sell you that stuff, just tell them, you got to go read something. So moving on, verse 7, what then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Just as it is written, he always goes back to the Old Testament, God has given them a spirit of stupor. Yes, the, the, the root word is stupid for stupor. Eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear to this very day. That's a combination of two passages, one in Deuteronomy 29 and the other in Isaiah 29. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their back always. That's from Psalms. This is about Israel. It's not talking about, you know, the evil, wicked, horrible Gentiles. It's talking about God's own selected people, which it's an amazing thing that Paul would bring this up and say, oh yeah, uh, you might want to just take a look at this. Reminds me of Stephen's sermon. If you, if you get to look at that in the book of Acts, it's a wonderful sermon. But he points his finger at the Jews and say, you guys have always hardened your hearts. It's always been the case. You think you're God's favored people and you're just a bunch of spoiled brats, really. It boils it down. So, has God, you know, the, the Jews have been seeking to be approved of before God on the basis of things that they do. And you and I, we understand from the scriptures, it's by God's grace alone, through faith alone. So, rejection and rebellion always carry a reaction and retribution. And it, you can't say just because I'm, you know, my, my daddy is the chief of police, so I never get a ticket sort of mentality. And yet there are people that do that. There are people that take grace, the grace of Jesus Christ, and use that as a license to sin. They think it's okay for them to go and do what any manner of things that they want because, well, God's going to forgive me anyway. That's a bunch of hooey right there. So we have to be careful we don't do the same. It says in Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's a much deeper passage that I'm ready to unpack, maybe one day soon, but... We're saved by grace through faith, and it's nothing that you do. It's a gift from God so that you can't say, I'm pretty smart. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior X amount of years ago. That makes me pretty smart. No, it means you're pretty pathetic because <laughs> on your own, you wouldn't have done that. It's a gift, so you can't boast of that. So, and I'm glad to give him the credit for all of that. Verse 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? In other words, have they stumbled to the place where the Jews will never come back, where they've turned their, God's turned their, his back on them or they've turned their back on him? And he says, certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. You're supposed to be making Jewish people jealous. Now, if their fall is riches to the world and their, and their failure riches to the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. When God brings the Jewish people back, what a wonderful thing it is. If you, if you know any Jewish people who have recognized that Jesus is the Messiah and they accept Christ into their life as their Lord and Savior, man, they just take off like a rocket because suddenly everything in the Old Testament makes sense. It's like, how did I not see that? And they're, because they're, they're called a completed Jew. They're completed. They, they've found their Savior, which has un, unfortunately not been published as widely as we should be doing. But if them turning their back on Jesus Christ means that we get to come to Christ, well, how cool is that? I'm, it, it, it's, like, it's like applying for a job and they, they, they offer you an astronomical amount of money and say, yeah, we'd like to put you in as soon as you can come in. And you say, listen, let me ask you, what happened to the guy that was in this place before I got here? 
Nah. It's a good question to ask, isn't it? You put your interviewer on edge. Whatever happened to the guy that had this really awesome job just before I came here? Well, we got rid of him. How come? He talked too much. You know. <laughs> if I heard that, I would think, maybe not such a great job to have. Maybe I don't want this job. Because you never know what you're getting into when you get a job, you know that? And yet... Because the Jews have turned their back on Jesus Christ, it has been made available for the Gentiles to accept the Jewish Savior, without which they would have received Jesus as the Messiah, would have been all over, and, and none of us would be even here. So, <clears throat> it's the, the sermon that Jesus gave about these two sons, the prodigal son, the one who just took his life and ran off and spent everything of his father's inheritance before his father died. And the other brother who stayed back, and you guys know the story, he went and he just blew all this cash on wild living, the scripture says, until he ran out of money, because you always run out of money, especially if you don't have an income. And so... He gets to the place where he sells himself as a slave and he's feeding pigs and he's wanting to eat the food that the pigs are eating, which is disgusting. It's, it's a disgusting thing for a Jewish boy to be taking care of unkosher pigs and then no less wanting to eat their food. And the older brother who represents the Jewish nation always did what was right, stuck around, but looked at the younger brother when he got back and all the fuss the father made over him and he was jealous. He heard all the noise and, and everything and he asked one of the servants, like he didn't go in. He didn't want to go in. He wanted to stay outside, but he asked one of the servants who's running back and forth and he goes, listen, your brother came back. You mean that dirty, rotten, low-life brother of mine who went and took half of dad's cash and went and blew it all, and he's back, and dad's throwing him a party? The next thing you hear, the father comes out of the house to talk to the older brother. And he says, the older brother says, listen, you never gave me a lamb. You never gave me anything to have a party with my friends. I never had a party with my friends. I'm surprised Jesus didn't say, well, the father said to him, because you never asked. But he says, listen, your, your brother who was dead is now alive. He, we, we should rejoice. We should be happy. Jesus set this whole scenario up. You know, you and I, the Gentiles, we are that one who took their inheritance and ran off and blew it. We, we're living our lives any, any which way we want to. But at some point we come back to the Father and God lavishes us with his grace. It's supposed to make the Jews jealous. Just exactly like this story. I wonder, are people looking at you and saying, man, there's something about that guy, something about that girl. They have joy, something up. That's what we're supposed to be doing, by the way. So I, we're running short on time. I don't want to read big, long stories. Do people see the exhibited grace in your life and get jealous? And do they know that the Father celebrates over you? It's one of those questions to take with you. In verse 13, for I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. So he says, listen, I'm, I'm Paul. Remember me? I changed my name. I used to be Saul. I changed to Paul. It's a Greek name. More, uh, you know, so you guys can remember my name and you don't think, oh, that guy's a Jew. Paul, he says, I've gotten on your level and, and basically because the Jews shut their ears to listen to him, he says, I'm going to the Gentiles. He kicked the, the dust off his feet and he says, I'm out of here. And he started telling Gentiles and that's how the church, as we understand it, came to be. And so he says, I magnify my ministry. I, he says, I, I don't want to talk bad about you guys. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh, he's talking about the Jewish people, and save some of them. For if their being cast away is the reconciling, reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? 
You see, Paul said, I'm out there to talk to the Gentiles. That's my ministry, guys. I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. But I hope I can make my fellow Jews jealous about the grace that is found in the Jewish Messiah. Now, the scripture goes on in chapter 37 in Ezekiel about some dry bones, and it talks about Israel coming back to life. Ezekiel's in this field, and there's all these bones, and God said, speak to these bones. He speaks to the bones. They all rise up, and God begins to put flesh on them, and he has this incredible dream, and yet they had no spirit in them. They were just bodies. And then God said, speak to the wind, and the wind came and blew into them, and then suddenly were there. It's about the resurrection of Israel as a nation, essentially. <clears throat> but because I've talked so long, I'm not going to read through it all. Verse 16, for if the first fruit is holy and the lump is also holy, these are all Jewish terms, by the way, for sacrifice, and if the root is holy, also are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, speaking of the Jews, and you being a wild, wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and the fatness. By the way, fatness is a good thing in the scripture. <laughs> the fatness of the olive tree. Do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Basically, as a Gentile, don't get all proud of the fact that you know and have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You got... You got plucked, you, you got popped into an existing root system of the Jewish nation. Where would the New Testament be without the Old Testament? It'd be nowhere, especially today with all these references. So grafting in is what they do when they take an existing root and they cut it in such a way that they can take another branch and put it in and they take these two things and make them one plant. It's in the hopes that you're making a better plant. I heard something today that you might want to know. If you like French wine, you're actually drinking wine from California. How many of you believe me? Well, I have one person who believes me. What happened, what happened, in, uh, what happened in France was they got this crazy blight that attacked the root systems of all of their vines. And so all their vines began to die. And so what they did is they sent away to America and they got these uh, disease-resistant roots and they were sent over. And now most of France has California vineyards. <laughs> See, now you believe me. That was kind of the reverse of what the scripture is talking about. You take an olive tree that produces all this wonderful sap and olive oil, obviously, and it produces it for the branches so it can make more olives. And he's saying, you guys, you Gentiles are like this wild olive tree. Wild olive trees don't produce fruit, by the way, because they're not trimmed. They're not cut back. It's the same thing with blueberries or anything else. If you don't trim them back, they won't produce like they should. What you want is a big, serious root system and very little leaves. And they do it with apple trees. You watch them hack those things up. They look like, like some decrepit hand in the middle of a field. <laughs> they do that so that it doesn't spend all of its energy making leaves and branches, but it pours it into the fruit, which is what you and I enjoy in the fall. So he talks about the... Gentiles being grafted in to the already existing root system of the Jews. And he says, don't get cocky and think you're all that in a bag of chips because you've been rooted in to the Jews. By the way, this is an olive tree that is in the, in the garden that Jesus used to go where he wept the last night with his disciples. This tree was probably in existence when Jesus was there. That's how old this tree is. And they have a whole bunch of them in, in, the, in uh, the Gethsemane, Gethsemane. I find it hard to pronounce things when it gets this late. This, this shows you what it looks like with a, with a root system that is incredibly large and obviously supported a much larger structure and now has these things that are grafted in that are growing up out of it. And he says, that's what happened to you Gentiles. You got grafted into the existing root. Don't get cocky and think you're all that and boast against the Jews because 
You were grafted in. You didn't earn this. It's grace. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. That's true. I agree with you. Maybe not the attitude, but the words are exactly right. Because of unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. That's when everybody goes, ooh. Now, on first reading of this, it might seem like, wow, you mean I could lose my salvation if I get boastful? You know, God never unchooses somebody. Just thought I'd let you know that again. So what is this talking about? Notice, when you talk about Israel, are you talking about every individual or are you talking about a nation? You know, when people talk about Americans, you know, we don't have a very good reputation in the world. Did you know that? Just go to France. Go anywhere. Here's the thing. When you talk, when you use big, broad brush strokes like that, you're not talking about every individual, right? Just like Israel isn't forgotten by God because most of the first century church were all Jews and they're still coming. And God's going to pour out a spirit in the end times and they're going to recognize Jesus as the Messiah when the Antichrist shows up. So it's, it's coming, guys. But he says, don't get all cocky. You could be pushed out as well. What about America? I got a question for you. Are we a Christian nation? Some of us here are. It says on our money, in God we trust, at least some of our money, it still says that. Is America a Christian nation? Well, it depends on who you listen to. If you listen to George W., he says yes. If you listen to Barack Obama, he says no. Actually, I'm siding with Barack Obama for a change. <laughs> this, is, this is what Washington said. Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits, and humbly to implore his protection and favor. He said that on Thanksgiving. So are we a Christian nation? Well, I can tell you that, you know, like when your child is born, is your child a Christian? Depends on how you define it. I think that this nation was founded on Christian principles. I think there were those who helped to found it who based it on Christian principles. <clears throat> we used to do the Pledge of Allegiance in school. Any of you old enough to remember that? I, It says, we are one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all, right? And so, if we are one nation under God, here's, here's something from long ago. Remember, if you don't believe in God, you're not a real American. <laughs> Keep prayer and God in school where they belong. Isn't it interesting to hear something like that that has such truth? Because you won't hear that on CNN. So if you say one nation under God and you don't believe in God, then you're not a real American. I thought that was fun. I like going on the internet. <laughs> George Washington also said, it is, an impos it is impossible to rightly govern a nation without God and the Bible. Can I get an Amen because you're just going to do whatever you feel like doing, which is what the prodigal son did. So we, as a nation that was started on Christian principles, should not get so cocky about our favorite position as America. You know, you know how many millions of babies have been killed in this country in the name of convenience? We don't, listen, we don't deserve to not have God's judgment on this nation, just so you know. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell, severity, but toward you, goodness. If you continue in this goodness, 
other eyes, you will also be cut off. He's speaking about a nation. The nation of Israel, for the most part, has turned their back on God. There are some who have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, but not all, a remnant. And just like us here in America, predominantly Christianity is most people say that they're Christian in this nation. Don't get cocky about that and think that we're not going to experience God's judgment because our nation isn't going in a great place. So there are no guarantees for rebellious people of God's unmerited favor if they persist in unbelief and arrogance. I think we're going to see some really hard times coming, guys because we name the name of Jesus Christ. They're already talking about reprogramming Christians. That'll be fun. There are no guarantees for a rebellious people of God's unmerited favor. If they persist in unbelief and arrogance, we cannot trust that this nation is not going to get judged by God because of the direction our nation's going just like the nation of Israel. So you see, Paul isn't talking about individual salvation and you losing your salvation. He's talking about favored nation status and God's universal blessing. This is what Thomas Jefferson said. God who gave us life gave us liberty. Can the liberties of a nation be secure when we have removed a conviction that these liberties are the gift of God? Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. Amen. That's interesting because Thomas Jefferson wasn't really a stellar Christian. He had a Bible he tore pages out of because he didn't agree with some stuff. And yet he recognized that if we don't see these freedoms as a gift of God and we don't honor the God who gave them, they're going to go away. So when speaking about Israel and them coming back, we have to be careful that our nation doesn't become like the nation of Israel, that we don't get cold-hearted and we don't get ambivalent and we don't just glue ourselves to the TV and listen to everything that's said because it's, an, it's a constant eroding at our faith in God. So that's, that's all I got to say about that. Mm -hmm.